Here's the bone marrow macrophage again, uh, the scramble silencing RNA and the bone marrow macrophage silencing RNA. I corrected these things to have RNA, so I have the wrong version, but it's almost complete. I fixed this, but it doesn't matter. There we are. The scrambling allows the production, the control allows a lot of metallothionine to form, the silenced cuts it down, another way of looking at the chart I just showed you in the slide before. Metallothionides bounded, bound to zinc means sulfur bound to zinc. Those are supposed to be bonds, I, I didn't do that very well. Metallothionines bound to zinc means sulfur bound to zinc because that's where we bind it. Uh, let's see what else we know. We can collect sample from this fraction, we can inject it uh, to a peptide column now, we're changing columns, the exclusion limit is going to be about 10,000 Dalton instead of 600,000 Dalton. So after this, the chromatogram may change. We've gotten used to now the 20, and we've got uh, sulfur plus oxygen forms SO plus. Why would we want to do that with ICPMS? This is why because there are all these interferences at sulfur 32. The most important is the oxygen we breathe. At sulfur 33, there are these experiments. Men remember, the plasma is blasting into the air. So there's a lot of air entrainment. What's in air? 80% nitrogen. So is it unusual that you would form this kind of polyatomic or this one at sulfur 34? All its natural isotopes if you shift the mass to charge to 48 for SO plus, you lose essentially all of these. Of course, they come at those. And it's a relatively clean region. So enter the Agilent 8800 ICPMS. Why not detect sulfur as well as detect zinc? We can now do it much better. This way we'll have sulfur and zinc two elements that we can watch what happens. We can watch the ratio of sulfur uh, to zinc. What will that mean? That will mean if I have zinc bound six times or zinc bound two times, I should see a ratio of three to one for sulfur to zinc. Uh, so let's go on and I'll just talk a moment about uh, this guy the uh, beauty here is we can form chemical reactions and we can limit the ion that's passed from here and chemically react it. In this case, we're going to pass the sulfur type species and we're going to react them with oxygen, just in that little simple reaction I showed before. And then we're going to ultimately detect with the third quadrupole this we call it triple quad, but it really is a reaction cell in the middle. It's really a double quad bisected by a reaction cell. So we're going to pass everything in this case. We don't have to just take one ion. We're going to pass everything but 32. And they're going to convert. Well, I think it's supposed to pass 32. Sorry. It, this is wrong, the way it's written. 32 sulfur converts to the SO+. Plus. M over Z equals 32 interferences at 32. Uh, we look at the clean 48 where the background is clean. Here's the payoff. 10 times lower limit of detection for sulfur than by using helium or xenon and trying to do the uh, thing we would do with a normal collision cell in normal ICPMS. We could use helium, we could use xenon, we could determine or analyze sulfur, but if we move it to this less background, remember detection limits are signal to background, then we get 10 times lower detection limit. This is great. This is great because detecting sulfur at part per billion levels, tens of part per billion, is really an important element to detect if one is going to do inorganic or biological 
uh, elements. And the last slide here says with the element 8800 to further probe, we switch to the peptide column. Notice we've switched over to here. 25 is where we're going to see the intensity. You see now two traces. We set the ICPMS 8800 to monitor sulfur as well as to monitor zinc. We see the zinc. The zinc intensity is over here, about 3,000, 3,500 units if we just look at the height. But look at the sulfur intensity. It's massive which must mean that there's a lot of methylothionine waiting around to grab something because where else does the sulfur come from as the cell is metabolizing things and so we see just a lot of sulfur. Well, what's this sulfur peak? We think it is a dimer or something like that because metallothionines can group together, one, two, three, of those, so we think that may represent that. We haven't proved that yet. Uh, what happens if we do the silencing RNA? This adds to the, this is good for that reviewer. Uh, if we use the silencing uh, RNA, as I said, I know this is the wrong thing now because I fixed this. Uh, at any rate, look what happens to the sulfur. Now, of course, all the things I've shown you are offset so we can see them. But look what happens to the sulfur. It probably, if I bring it down to the, to the base, is 2,000, 2,500 compared to 80,000. Look at the major decrease in sulfur. What does that mean it's a major decrease in? It means the metallothionine is decreased in a major way with when we silence the zip, the transport protein. It doesn't need it. The cell doesn't care. It doesn't want it anymore, and it's not going to form those uh, metallothionines. Let's look at the zinc. It, too, is reduced, but it's reduced by maybe a factor of four or something like that, rather than a factor of 30 to 40,000. So we have a lot of evidence that it is the metallothionines reducing the zinc and from the model we developed, we're pretty sure that uh, we are uh, uh, actually depriving the HC of the zinc. That deprivation comes from the normal process of lysing, which cuts the, uh, the fungus up. But in addition, zinc depletion leads to a more efficient NADPH production. That enzyme then generates reactive oxygen species. And we did the reactive oxygen species by fluorescence detection. So here is the same thing said again, uh, zinc to sulfur ratio. Um, here is the bone marrow macrophage, the scrambled, not much difference within the error, uh, really the same. But once we silence it, what happens to the zinc to sulfur ratio? It goes up to this. What is this ratio? This one to that one. It's three to one. What's that tell us? Normally, we get two zincs per metallothionine. This tells us we get six zincs per metallothionine. So even when it's silenced, we reduce the zinc by binding it with the metallothionine. This is perfect. OK, you will have to wait to read about the, our questions about the dye and their effectiveness. And are they really selective? And are they really specific? The answer is no. Uh, but you'll have to wait to read about that. That paper is uh, virtually done. This is an older group picture, but this is uh, Holy, oh, I don't really think I'm that short. Uh, I don't know. I, I think she jimmied the camera or something. See, I did change it on one slide here, but I didn't change it at the beginning. Again, thanks very much, uh, Professor Joachim. Thank the students here for bearing with me all week long and then, for heaven's sake, coming back in the afternoon. I don't know if our students would have done that. Uh, but this is the principal guy uh, in our laboratory doing most of this. 
Anna, as she pronounces her name, Anna, is actually doing copper, doing similar experiments, but trying with copper. Copper, it looks like, is going to be important, but it's at much less concentration than zinc. Uh, so that's it, and I thank you for your time and your attention. It's really quite interesting, it's a very complex mechanism inside the cell. And, uh, could you uh, tell a little bit more about the sample preparation? Because we just have a look at the results, the data, and the, how it's involved the, the sample volumes you have. Do you analyze the cytosols in the, the cell? How it's uh, Basically, this uh, is our, our basic preparation. This, uh, the mice are, are grown in the uh, animal facility in the medical center. We do not have one on our campus. Biology used to have an animal lab, but with all the regulations today and all the difficulties and the people you have to hire to maintain animals, we do not have one on our campus, and I wouldn't be doing this anyway. So through the various biological techniques, she isolates a white blood cell from the mouse. And this mouse may have been given a diet that was high in zinc, low in zinc. It may have been uh, treated with uh, the disease, or we might add the disease here. We might activate this after we've taken out the white blood cell. So we can activate, or I can introduce infection at that point. So this is that one that had the star, star BMM phi, uh, the Greek letter. And so we can use things like one-tenth percent SDS. It works nicely, so we pretty much continue with this procedure. And then we're always going to look for, on our part for total metals. And that can come from the disease, you notice I reported a number of times, zinc in the disease, zinc in the macrophage, and that's the way we got that. Then the next thing is to do some speciation through size exclusion chromatography separation. This is lacking some things, but I, I can provide you by email the procedure. It's the same way all the time, mainly by doing SEC with a TRIS buffer. So it's not particularly complicated. Once we take up the lysate in the TRIS buffer and do the separation, uh, basically, and get the size exclusion chromatography. Um, the, uh, we've used two or three columns. Uh, the one mostly used is this one out here with a 600,000 Dalton exclu exclusion limit, meaning that anything greater than 600,000 comes out first. We don't have much interest in that. We're not going to find much protein there. But we do see signal there often, and that probably is from zinc in the membrane. Uh, and so we're expecting some kind of higher molecular weight. We tend to be interested in this piece and over here. So we can take all of the fractions, if we wish, collect them, go to another type of chromatography. We don't in this study, but in other studies we have. We have gone from uh, peaks here to reverse phase chromatography. We have gone to ion exchange. Not in this study, because this gave us, after we discovered what these things were, enough information because we could watch this go up and down as a function of the biological experiments. Uh, and then we do the bottoms up proteomics, which means we take uh, the fraction from here and we uh, treat it with uh, mass spec grade trypsin to digest it. And uh, that then goes to, I'm not, it, it's not, it says shotgun proteomics, but our instruments is a nano LC uh, chip which gets inserted into the uh, ion trap instrument. And of course, we get a mass spectrum. Then we get MS2, a second mass spectrum from several of the major ions. And we submit those to a database. Very easy. Uh, you can, any of you can go an online to Mascot, and you can submit any peptide sequence you want to the database. 
and it'll come back with answers. Well, I think you got this, I think you got that, whatnot. The most important thing it comes back with always is metallothionines. That isn't the full detail, but I can provide that to you too if you want it. Thank you.